Hey everyone, welcome to another Speed Seekers podcast. Today's going to be fun because my guest is my friend and fellow coach, uh, Michael Zemicki. Mike, uh, welcome back. Welcome back to the show. The last time we did this together, this show together, you and I were in a uh, less than high quality motel near Watkins Glen. I think I'm hoping you're a little more comfortable this time around than the last time. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm home in Vermont, so I'm, you know, I'm sitting here with my dog in my office, so uh, it doesn't get much better than this. Yeah. Well, does it, is is that better than going to the track? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Trick question. You know, it's funny. It's funny you should say that because if you looked around my house, you'd have no idea what I do for a living. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you can infer from there. Uh yeah, well I see your posts and I think you're out climbing a mountain or I don't know. Absolutely. Uh, most yeah. of the time. Yeah, yeah. As I had a client, a client who knew me well that I worked with for about three years, John Gooding once said, uh, three or four years, he uh, he looked to me and he goes, what are you doing in this business? <laughs> yeah. I, I think we've all asked ourselves that question. But uh, actually, you know what? That's a good, that's a good point, though, is uh, balance, balance in one's life. And, Absolutely. you know, how many drivers have you coached that you kind of go, you know, you really should get some balance in your life? Yeah, no, absolutely. And that is, you know, and that's true. I mean, I, you know, and that's true for the, you know, the, the kids, especially it's really important for the kids' parents to hear. Yeah. Um, you know, how many times have you, you know, tried to explain that to a kid's parents that, by the way, their learning curve is going to be all over the place and they might suck next year, but don't give up on them. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and and or they might get interested in girls for a while or boys or whatever. Right. Um, so, you know, it's it's really important to keep that balance. And for me, you know, it's uh, I, I, you know, to take a more serious answer to your question. I love teaching people. Uh, um, I suspect you're exactly the same yeah. as I. And, uh, you know, and that's why I don't care whether I'm working with, you know, a top pro racer or somebody just learning how to drive. I mean, I just did uh, a team camp for uh, Monticello, uh, you know, which is a private track outside of New York. And we had kids that when they showed up for the base camp, didn't know how to drive a stick shift. Yeah. And, you know, and so I'm sitting there going, all right, let me take myself back 40 years to when I was doing this kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. And I got to tell you, it was a gas. Um, I love you know, going watching, back to the basics. Yeah. Yeah. Watching, watching those kids develop and grow and, you know, and be like, and overcome, you know, basic fears of, I don't know anything like just teaching somebody anything is, uh, as you know, it's just, it's a wonderful thing. It, it is. And one of the things that, uh, you know, every time I see you on a post where you've, you're, you're up climbing some mountain in the snow or whatever, and I like to go on hiking, not as much, uh, probably not, well, not as extreme as you do, but it's amazing to me how many times I'm on a trail somewhere halfway up the side of a mountain somewhere and I go, you know, when I'm working with so-and-so, I need to work on this and I need to, I get most of my thinking done when I'm out doing that. Do you have that? Yeah. No, no, absolutely. It's a, you know, I mean, I'm, uh, when we finish up today, I'll probably go ride my bike and, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, and, you, and I don't know if you experience this, but all the time I have those moments and it, and it's, and as you know, it comes from, from, and it's something you have to work on with your clients at the racetrack, which is you have to have a brain that's relaxed, right? Yeah. That's, that to sort of find that little bit of flow state. And, you know, so those thoughts start coming to you and it could be when you're just driving to the airport or driving to go get groceries or on your bicycle or hiking or whatever, you get your brain relaxed. And I, and I find that one of the hard things for me is I'll have, and sometimes it's even finding what I think is, oh my God, this is the right way to say this to somebody. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll sit there and I'll try to repeat it to myself and remember it because I know that there's going to be a percentage of the times that I'm just going to freaking forget it and drive myself nuts. So <laughs> speaking of, <laughs> of, speaking of thinking of different ways of saying things, you know, one of the things that you and I have been, uh, uh, trading mini rants on. I, I, I loved it. You sent an email to Peter Kroos and I, whenever, whether I, last week or something like that. And you said, yeah. let me go on a mini rant here. And I'm like, oh, I love mini rants. Uh, and one of the mini rants that we've been on lately is this idea that you or I or some other coach says something. And all of a sudden that becomes the rule. That becomes the gospel. And, and you know, I take full responsibility for saying some things and writing some things that people then go, oh, well, that's it. 
that's the answer to everything. And uh, I think it would be fun for us just to tackle some uh, some common myths that are out there. Will be the, like the, who, who are the myth mythbusters? Uh, yeah, this? absolutely. Uh, I forget the name of the two guys. Um, uh, let's let's attack a couple of those, and let's start with the one that you started uh, the, you started this with with the email last week when you you were talking about coasting, being on pedals or not being on pedals all the time. Absolutely. R rant away. Go for it. Well, the first thing I got to say is if one more person looks at me and says, well, you know, I read Ross Bentley said. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all my you're, fault. I take all. You're going to be getting you're going to be getting like the Ted Kaczynski or whatever his name package in the mail. Yeah. OK. So, you know, so, so watch. So, so watch for that. <laughs> the uh, no, that rant came about because literally I was um, I had signed up and was looking through a forum. Right. And. And right off the bat, let me tell you that, you know, that something that goes hand in hand with me loving to teach is that I love to learn. Right. Yeah. And you can learn from you can learn from, you know, car forums. You can learn from Ross Bentley's. You can learn from reading books about other sports. You can read about other stuff. Right. And uh, and so I was reading these forum posts that had to do with educating, uh, you know, drivers. And that's where I came across. That's when I had to write you and Peter, because there was this very adamant post about, you know, being on one pedal or the other. Right. You know, you got to be on one pedal or the other. And I got to tell you, that goes right back to when I first started driving in 1980. Um, that was very much, you know, there were very there were these rules that were set in concrete. Right. Yep. You know, it's either full gas or full brake. Uh, you know, the faster you get out of the corner, the the faster you go to all the way down that straightaway. You know, uh, exit speed is exit speed is king. Um, you know, there were just a million of those type of things. Right. Yep. Um, you know, sooner you can get on the throttle, the faster you'll go. Um, and basically none of them are true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, hey, I, but, and, 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 and I'm going to disagree with you there. They're true sometimes. No, absolutely. They're not absolutes. Yeah. Right? Um, and that's what happens is, is that, you know, you'll answer innocently and in a professional way, you'll answer somebody's, um, you know, post that's saying, hey, you know, I was I was at VIR or I was at or Trace Track X and I was in turn seven and this happened and whatever. And, you know, you give them an honest answer and it's the same thing with me. I'll get I'll talk to somebody and say, OK, you know what? Here is rule number and i always joke uh, you know i'm always like okay re here's rule number 238 yeah in this corner you're going to do this um and and you sit there and you say okay but that's relatable you know what you're doing to to add to what you're saying for me what you really need to do it's not like you have one style of driving it's not like there's one rule you are building a toolbox of skills and then you've got all these different tools that then you can apply when they're appropriate Right. It's like being smooth. There's times when being smooth is the worst thing you can do. Yeah. Right. And then there's other times where it's guess what? You better be freaking smooth here. You know. So, yeah, I mean, that's and, and it's easy to, you know, it's easy for me to get going on, you know, more than a mini rant about this stuff just because I think people get locked in. And so many of those are classic, you know, well, um, to. Yeah, go ahead. And, and I would say, I mean, the, the reason we're renting here is because we do care. No, absolutely. Yeah. And it, and and nothing is, as you know, I'm, I'm sure you've been in the, this situation before where you get a, a driver that's been, you know, they're, uh, you know, they've been doing DE days or, you know, they've been going and doing club stuff and they've worked with instructors and God bless those instructors that work those events, by the way. Yeah. Um, you know, and. But at some point they got latched on to, you know, you have to be off the brake when you turn in. You have to carry brake when you turn into the corner. Uh, you have to go directly from the brake to the throttle, like these basic rules that. And I think that that's one of the things that happens is those basic rules get imprinted on somebody's muscle memory early on because it's sort of the safest thing to do, um, you know, as determined by somebody. Um, versus sort of giving them parameters for, you know what, here's how you need to determine what you want to do. 
Well, uh, and I want to come back to the coasting thing, but you got me on on one right now that you, you triggered something there was the, the what somebody thinks is safer. And one of the ones that just drives me up the wall is late apex everything. And, yeah. And, oh, yeah. And, <laughs> because because that's safer because you won't run out of room on the on the exit. Yeah, but but right. but but you have to right. turn sharper to get the car to turn to go to that later apex. And when you're turning sharper, you've increased the chance of losing control of the car. So is that any safer? Right, right. But then, then, then yeah, yeah. And you add to that, and I'm, you know, it's funny because uh, so here, let's go to let's go to the coasting thing, and we'll yeah. go to a guy that we'll go to a guy that I worked with a bit this summer, right? Who is he drives a Cayman GT4. He's really quick in that car now. Does a really good job, but literally a big part of what we've been working on this summer is getting him off the brake pedal yeah. because what happens with folks is they go and they start driving around right and they're building speed and they're getting faster and this is going to tie into one of the myths we're going to talk about here in a sec but then they discover that oh by the way going hard to the brake pedal is an easy way at a certain point in their learning curve is an easy way to gain a second and a half or two seconds. Like it's it's like it magically appears off your lap time, um, you know, or disappears off your lap time. And and as a result of that, you know, everybody's brain works on a reward system, you <laughs> yeah. know. So as a as a result of that, suddenly hard braking, hard late braking, is a wonderful thing. Now you add to it that most modern cars have ABS. And it's easy. The word I use is buried. It's easy then for those guys to get buried in the brake pedal, right? Because they've got their foot so far down. I mean, I drove his Cayman GT4 to do some datum laps, you know, a month and a half ago or something. And my brake, I was braking earlier than he was, but my brake deceleration rate was exactly the same as his. And I was at 550 pounds of force. He's at 1600. Wow. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Wow. And then you sit there and you start, you know, I'm nothing but logical. And you start looking at it and you're going, OK, I'm trying to get him to release the brake pedal. If he's at 1600 pounds of force, he's got his foot another two inches towards the floorboard. So when he starts to release, he can think about it. He can release from 1600 to 1200. He hasn't changed a thing. Right. Right. <laughs> You know, he can go from 1,200 to 800. He hasn't changed a thing. Right, right. So it's a lot harder for, for that guy then to retrain that brake pedal, you know, that brake pedal muscle memory to get off the brake pedal, right? And finally, when he did, I was literally, you know, I was sitting there going, just like you are, you know, I'm going through my, you know, and everybody, we all go through this, where you're sitting there and you're like, like okay, he's not getting it. I'm going to say it a different way, mm -hmm. right? He's not getting it. I'm going to say it a different way. He's not getting it. I'm going to say it firmer. He's he's not getting it. I'm going to grab him by the front of the shirt and tell him to do this, right? right. You know, and you just go through, <laughs> go through all that stuff. And finally, I got him to do it. I don't even remember how. And he was like, oh, my God, the car really turns in the middle of the corner. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, welcome to a tire that's got nothing to do but corner. Ah. And by the way, you're not on a pedal. You know, it's, uh, but it's just, yeah. Well, and one last thing, and then let's get into the why and what and when to be off pedals and everything. But, but, yeah. you know, I, I, I can hear somebody right now listening to us talk and go, yeah, but doesn't that depend right. on where the driver is in their development? You know, uh, Talking to a driver that's, you know, they're on the track for their third time versus somebody who's a pro level, elite level driver in an Indy car are going to be different things. And uh, there is some truth to that. But uh, I think the point we're trying to make here is that just because it worked at this point in your driving development career doesn't mean that it's going to work over here. Again, they're not rules. They're not like this always right. has to happen. Does that make sense? No, ab absolutely. I mean, you got to have, and that's part of the toolbox thing. But, and I will also tell you that that ties into, uh, you know, something else that I briefly mentioned to you, which is, you know, it was racing when, when you and I started racing. I'm not sure when you started. I started in 1980. It was a lot simpler deal, right? I mean, you know, and uh, and it was easier for you know, these things that are now we're now calling miss, 
it's easier for them to get set in stone because people didn't understand it as much because you didn't have data, you didn't have video, you didn't have dedicated professional coaches and all that to look at that stuff. So yeah. part of, this is me looping back to saying part of the learning when to, you know, when to keep your foot on the brake pedal and go straight to the throttle, when to let the car coast, when to let the car get more directional in some way is that is finding people that if you can't afford a coach is then going and reading and not locking into, oh, you know, I just need this basic technique is trying to expand your brain and what you understand. And if you can do a coach or find a good mentor or talk to different people at the racetrack or look at different data, um, you know, that's all valuable stuff to do because there's a, and there's a ton of that stuff out there. I mean, I'm on my way to Summit Point for a PCA event next weekend. And, you know, I'm going on and I've been to Summit for a million years and I'm looking uh, like everybody else. I'm looking on YouTube for good videos to reference for my guy. And I found a good video. And by the way, there's a ton of off throttle time, uh -huh. you know, which was in my notes, which was like, hey, by the way, when you go to this link, watch this and learn. And it isn't in every corner, but it is in certain corners. And you're like, OK, there's a reason for it. And now to answer your question, why you do it is you sit there and you say, OK, you go back to that basic, you know, skippy rule that that I learned in 1980 which was, you know, you, the tire can do three things. It can slow you down, it can turn you, and it can speed you up. Um, and it can only do 100% of each one of those things or in a blended fashion. So you start to think about it and you're like, okay, so if you turn into the corner with your foot buried in the brake pedal with ABS fully on in a modern race car and you got the steering wheel turned, that outside tire is working its ass off trying to slow the car down as well as the ABS can manage. Um, while you're doing that and it's not really thinking about cornering a lot. So that car is not thinking about turning as well as it could. So that's why you need to, at the very least, learn to start to come back up off that brake pedal, just like you would. And there's an argument for maybe learning not to drive and not an ABS car at times, yeah. um, is start to get a feel for how, you know, releasing that brake pedal can help that car turn. Um, and then if you really need the car to turn, which by the way, your direction as you approach the apex or at the apex is really what determines when you can get the throttle on, which is going to lead to another myth, right? Yep. Um, which is you got to let that car, I can't tell you, I use the word directional, but it's like, you got to let the car finish turning, right? You got to let the car be directional. It doesn't do you any good to have that car not fully turned where you can't, you know, as I see, see daylight at the exit of the corner. If you go to throttle before that point, once again, not hard rule because there's times you do. But if you go to throttle before that point, there's a good chance you're not getting out of that corner as fast as you could or you're going to have to make a throttle adjustment. Well, the, and when we before we got started here, we were talking about how all, all these things are interrelated. And, you know, as you're saying that, I'm like. I hear drivers go, yeah, but I'm clipping the same apex. But it also right. depends on the angle the car is at at that right. apex, right? And, and yeah, it's directional. It's the amount of rotation. And, 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 you know, when I first started driving, and by the way, I started in 77, so we're pretty close to the same there. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I was I had that, you know, I got those messages, you know, be on one pedal, the other, never coast, all that kind of stuff. And it took me a while to start to figure out that, Every now and then, there's a point in time where I don't want to be on the, I want to be off the brakes, but I don't want to be on the throttle yet because the car hasn't changed direction, hasn't rotated right. enough. And that's slowing me, so, slow, slowing me down being able to get back to power. And if I just, I, I almost, because I hate the word coasting because it just sounds right. so passive, I, I say hesitate, just hesitate right. and and call it whatever you want. Call it a toaster. I don't care. But right. <laughs> hesitate just that fraction of a second. Let the car finish rotating. Be on the right angle when you're going past the apex. And then when you go to power, you're going to power. Right. Absolutely. I call it off-pedal time a lot of times. Yeah. People that I think are going to be offend offended by coasting because that sounds like a, it sounds technical and like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. Um, the... Uh, you know, but it's interesting. You go back to the same guy I've been working with a bunch this summer in the Cayman. He is a he and his nephew, who I've worked with a little bit, are just unbelievable, over the top, 
math nerds, right? Uh-huh. Um, and they're and they're great to work. I love working with them because they're way smarter than me with the math stuff, right? And uh, and it's interesting because I talk to him about being at the apex, and he'll look at me and be like, "But that's a different apex." And he's right, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because you look at that and it's and you sit there and, and you know, and, and once again, it's if the angle is different at the apex, you are at a slightly different apex, even though you and I think we're at the same spot. Right. So, yeah. there, so, so there's the you know, there's that splitting hair things. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's it's more just when you're tight to the inside of the corner or at your apex that the direction is correct, right? And you've right. allowed the car to get there and finish turning and not go, which is leads right into, you know, the, the you know, what your guys, you know, are, uh, you know, are thinking something you said earlier, which is, you know, getting on the throttle. Like it just doesn't do you any good to get on the throttle before that car hasn't finished turning. And if, by the way, you're you've driven enough to where and and even a good club guy has probably driven enough laps where they've got a sense of how well their car corners if they feel like the car's slowed down enough but they don't think they've turned enough right then don't touch the throttle pedal yet let yeah. the car finish turning and leave because all you're going to do is if you think you've slowed down enough and you know that staying on the brake pedal is going to slow you up too much Guess what? That's a problem. If you go to throttle there, it's a problem because now you're going to induce either some push or change your line or not allow the car to finish turning and it get early to the exit. Right. Yeah. So that, you know, it's it's like that. So the going to the throttle is not the solution. It's just going to be another problem. Waiting is going to be the solution. And by the way, then knowing where you put the brakes on last time where you thought you were overslowed too soon in the corner, then it's like, oh, wait a minute, I can break later and maybe roll more speed in the middle of the corner. Yeah. Well, first of all, I didn't know you were going to get all mathematical on me there with the... <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it, it actually points out a, a really important point, though, is uh, we as performance drivers, race drivers, whatever you want to call us, uh, crazy people that drive around tracks quickly, we're not always the most patient people in the world. And it takes discipline. It takes patience to let the car finish turning and be off the pedals for that fraction of a second at times so that now the car is pointing in the right direction. So that then when you go to the power, you go to the power, right? Absolutely. And that is, and you just used one of my favorite words, which is patience. Yeah. Um, Which by the way, and, and it's what I always say to people I'm working with, it's, it doesn't seem like a word you should use with driving a race car. Right. right. Like it's like, you, but I use it all the time um, when I'm uh, when I'm talking to drivers. And by the way, you know, it's the you know, you're 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 talking about that patience. Uh, you know, let's go back to another way of, you know, I mentioned earlier, you know, talking to this guy that I've been working with this summer and, and you know, trying a million different ways of saying things. I'll tell you that to me, one of the things that often goes with the word patience is me describing how a corner should feel, right? Which is, you know, to me, I think if you've maxed a corner out, like if you've done everything you can and, and you've just Michael Schumachered it, right? Yeah. Or, or, or Ayrton Senate it or whatever. And those guys had their own issues, right? Yeah. Um, is that, is, is that the break zone? You're, you're fully like, oh my God, this is, I am, fully maxed out, like things are feeling like fairly tense, right? And you're turning in and you're like, Ooh, maybe this is going to work. And you're, you're getting on off, you're getting off the brake pedal and you're like, Jesus, am I carrying a lot of speed? And then I often say that in that there's a little section of that corner there, when you come off that brake or are coming off the brake and letting that car finish turning, where it's actually calm for a bit. Like it's like, it's strangely calmer than, you know, or emotionally, um, you know, not as, as stressful. Um, and then by the way, I say that then when you do have that car directional and start chasing the throttle, that should then be the, you know, that mirror image of the brake zone where it's like, I think I can make this work. Oh my God, I got to keep whirling throttle on. Am I going to run out of road? Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. Made it, you know? So it's Um, the come into the corner with your hair on fire 
put the fire out and then let light it on fire again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, the flame is the flames turned up. You're burning your hand. You pull your hand away from the flame for a while and you go, wow, this feels better. And then you put your hand back in the flame. Um, but the, yeah. and, and of course, listening to this, this applies to every single corner at every single track in every single car in the world, right? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, it does not, Ross. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Saying that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, can, can I tell you one of my uh, frustrating, one of my, oh, one of absolutely. the myths that that drives me up the wall? Um, absolutely. Is that whole the the most important corner is the one that leads on the longest straightaway? Oh my God! Yeah, <laughs> yeah, hey, and. You know, it sometimes it's not a bad place to start. You know, and we right. we need a place to start, right? It's it's right. kind of like the even to the point of be on one of the pedals, right? That's not a right. bad place to start. But if you really want to get going well, there are going to be times where you're going to be off the pedals. Uh, all I know is uh, a lot of the corners that lead on a longest straight on a lot of tracks. Again, not always. They're not the most challenging ones. No. And they're usually a slower corner. So if you screw it up, it doesn't take that much effort to get that speed back. Uh, you know, I'd rather start accelerating my car in second gear than making a mistake and screwing up in a fourth gear corner and try to re-accelerate that car. But Absolutely. Plus, yeah. you know, I just, I, I, am my, and I, <laughs> I'm not even going to say a rule, a guideline, a, not even a speed secret, it's, but I like to when I go to a track, whether I'm driving or coaching, I look I I looked at it and go, okay, which is the scariest corner on the track? Which is right. the one that's going to intimidate everybody else more than everywhere every other corner? That's the corner that I want to be. I want to be the king of that corner. Okay, so here here I am. I'm going to totally contradict you, right? Cool. To to answer the to answer the no, there's hard set rules. Yep. So your speed secrets. Um, you know, uh, email this morning was about Jim Kearney did a great job of, you know, the runoffs are coming up at Road America, right? And one of the guys he had um, writing in there was talking about the kink, right? Yeah. So you look at how many times have you gone to Road America with a client and pick any car, right? And, you know, the kink is always like, you know, oh my God, it's scary. It's blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, whatever. And the reality is, is that, you know, you look at a car, unless it's a huge, weird differential, you know, you drive down to the kink in a GT3 cup car and you have one guy that's, you know, that's lifting off 100 feet before the turn in point and then rolling back into throttle or one guy that's doing a quick little dab on the brake and rolling back into throttle. Um, and then you've got, you know, the, the young guy rolling up there who's just like turning in and maybe just the tiniest crack on the throttle or maybe manages to do it flat one time. The reality is the time differential between those two. And there is a big excitement differential between those two. A couple of tenths. The time differential is like minuscule. Yeah. Right. So you sit there and you go, OK, so there's an example where maybe the scariest place. And that's what I always tell people. I go, this corner is not going to make or break your lap time. Right. Well, let's well, let's just be solid here. Yeah, exactly. And and I'm uh, the point of this is to talk about there's exception to every rule. When I look at right. the kink, I almost don't consider that a corner. Right. You know, but the carousel. Now there oh, is yeah. a fast, long corner that you spend a ton of time in. Oh, unbelievable! I mean, and that is, I mean, I, you know, I go to I go to Road America, and the carousel is. You know, for uh, I, you know, and everybody's got different uh, metrics that they apply to racetracks. Right. Um, and I could dig around on my laptop here at my desk and probably come up with it. But, you know, in one of the ones that I have for a lot of racetracks is is for different classes of cars that I'm working with is, you know, percentage of the lap or time spent of the lap cornering versus on a straightaway. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's obvious, you know, if you look at a you know, if you look at a, uh, you know, a, a Road America to a Lime Rock, those are obviously very different metrics, right? And and it's easy to understand that. But you start looking at Road America and you're like, mm, you spend more time in the corners here than you think. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like everybody thinks Road America is all about straightaways. 
Um, and you know, the simplest one is, is, you know, when, uh, you know, if, if somebody who's going to the runoffs listens to this, or you've been to the runoffs after Ross puts this up, go to your data and just look at how much time for when you turned your hands under the bridge, going into the carousel to the exit, how much time you spent in your whatever sports racer, um, it's going to be a buttload, yeah. right. Um, of seconds. Um, you know, and uh, and you sit there and you go, man, the carousel's pretty damn important to a lap time at Road America. If you could carry oh. one mile an hour more all the way through oh, the carousel, how much of right. a difference is that going to make in a lap time? A huge amount. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. And it's it's but there is. So there is going back to my math guys. Right. Yep. So this summer, the the nephew of this guy who has started driving and now is uh, OK to drive on his own loves math. Right. So I was sitting there and I hate math. And uh, <laughs> I, and I'm sitting there. I'm sitting there one day at Monticello trying to figure out the difference in one mile an hour, what it would do to the lap time around Monticello, just average speed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't I'm coming up with numbers and I'm not believing them. So I had this 13 year old kid do it, um, you know, and he ran the numbers for me. And of course, in in a minute and a half, he had, you know, five mile an hour differences incrementally. And then five minutes later, had zero to 200 mile an hour differences done. Right. God bless those people that are good at math. But I'll tell you, one mile an hour. And this leads up to a huge thing that I'm going to say here in a sec. One mile an hour is a huge difference, right? Yes, yes. Um, and that's what people don't get. Like when you ask somebody to go a little faster in a corner, how many times do people overstep that boundary, right? <laughs> and, you know, where you're like, and you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe I said this to him because now we've got to like dial him back and I've screwed this up and I'm a horrible coach. And yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, because, you know, you're only at and, and now I try to be very specific and say, I want you to go one mile an hour faster. Yes. By the way, when you walk over to the soda machine, you're walking at two and a half miles an hour. Yeah. So yeah. let's put this in perspective. Right. Like you just barely need to go faster here to make this all work, you know, um, you know, but that's and that's the mistake people make in qualifying, whatever. But I'm going to go back to something you said just to just to close one door a little bit, which is another metric that I think is important to people to understand is that to understand what percentage that mile an hour is in the corner that you're in. Right. Because when you you know, and you said, oh, maybe it's a slow corner onto a fast straightaway. And it's like, yeah, you know, maybe that's, you know, it's easier to do. And yeah, it's more important or whatever. But think about it. If you've got a corner where the min speed is 32 miles an hour, one mile an hour is a, a one mile an hour change is a bigger percentage change than if you've got a corner where the min speed's 96. Mm -hmm. And so then that changes how you approach that corner, doesn't it? <laughs> so so there in itself lies a whole nother, like there's a whole nother subset where we could start digging through data and looking at stuff and whatever and come up with a whole hour of talking about stuff of, of how, you, how you change what your approach is simply based on that percentage, right? So, Well, well yeah. again, you're getting all mathematical here. And, and, and by the way, you know, there are three kinds of people in the world, those who are good at math and those who are not. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah, and I am so on the I'm not side. Oh my god. Well, yeah. and, and you know, I just to kind of close the one up about the most important corner. And and again, sometimes the most important corner is the one that leads on the longest straightaway. But right. let's take. I mean, we've already kind of looked at uh, Road America and the carousel and how important that is. You know, I would also say, term one. I've seen people make massive gains in lap time at term one oh. at Road America. It's not a very long straightaway afterwards relative to the other ones. Go to Mosport, Canadian Tire Motorsport Park, right. turn 5B. It leads onto that big, long straightaway up the hill. Really important. But I'll tell you what, turn one, turn two, turn three, oh turn God. four, yeah. turn eight are all super fast corners. And you spend more time in them. And it's going to make a bigger difference. You'll have to turn 11 at, at Laguna Seca leads onto the Absolutely. longest straightaway. Yeah. You know, is it the most important? I'm going to say you're going to make up more time in turn six and turn nine and turn four. I mean, that's where you're going Absolutely. to make. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and by the way, right. And by the way, to go back to my percentage thing, 
Yeah. If you and 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 I'll loop this around to one more sort of math thing that that uh, you know that I is a is a pretty solid rule that I think we can stick to, which is you know if you're turning onto the front straightaway at Laguna, you know that's a slow corner, and the reality is is that if you come off that corner one mile an hour slower than somebody else that's one mile an hour. You've probably matched them in the break zone. You've probably matched them in the, you know, maybe you've overdriven the middle of the corner and you're a mile an hour slower because of that. But the reality is that that one mile an hour is a smaller percentage than if you come off of, you know, turn one or drive through turn one at road America, two miles an hour quicker than the guy who you're racing with. Right. Like it's a bigger thing. And then that leads us to the whole concept, which you started this all with, um, or, you know, sort of alluded to, which is, you know, the, that exit speed. And I know I said it earlier as one of the basic rules, exit speed is king, right? Yeah. And the reality is, is that, you know, aerodynamics and mechanical drag and horsepower and all that, you know, drag on the car increases exponentially as you build speed, right? So there you go getting you, mathematical it, again on me. <laughs> yeah, I know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, thank God I've had good people to teach me this stuff. Yeah. The um, but, you know, and, and I'm good at looking at data just because I look at it and, and I'm like, well, heck, how come this is happening? Right. right, you right. Know, it's, there's no there's no miracles there. But the reality is and we've all seen it on data is you've got a guy that comes out of, you know, turn three at Road America comes out of, you know, uh, it comes onto the front straight away, comes out of, you know, whatever the corner out of the hairpin at Coda, right? Someplace onto a long straightaway, you know, and you're working with a gentleman driver and this teammate is the guy who's winning the championship and your gentleman guy comes out of the corner and, you know, when he gets his hands straight, he's going, he's going 67 and the, you know, the wonderkind is going 71. Yeah. And at some point of that straightaway, they're both going 130. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Or they're both going 110. Yeah. So you, you you look at those you look at those lines come together and they're in, you know, identically prepared cars, you know, a spec car or something, you know, or same aerodynamic drag on the car, same horsepower. At some point, that stuff equalizes it all. And that does not negate the fact that the Wonderkind is getting down that elapsed time down his straightaway yes. is lower. But it doesn't mean that he's getting to the end of that straight any faster. Right. right. He's not going any quicker at the end of that straight. And at some point, those two cars match up. Yeah. You know, at that teen camp at Monticello, I did a very quick thing on data with these kids that were, you know, 13 to 16. And that was one of the examples I showed them is I literally pulled up data on my uh, on my computer and put it up on the screen and was like, OK, here's one young guy driving out of this corner. He's going five miles an hour faster. And it was at Monticello. It's going five miles an hour faster than this other guy. Look at how these cars and I did it with and I did it with Miata speeds and I did it with uh, GT3 uh, Porsche Cup cars. Right. And and they look remarkably similar how it all happens. Right. So, you know, I just wanted to close those doors, which are important for you guys like you and I to close those doors to people saying, yeah, but, you know, that's Ross and Mike. They're talking about an Indy car. We're not. We're talking about anything. Yeah. Yeah. And that leads to the whole conversation around in that, you know, myth of whoever gets the throttle first is going to win the race down the straightaway. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's kind of an incomplete one, because first of all, at what speed are they starting to apply the throttle? And secondly, are they going to full throttle or are they just starting to get into the throttle? Like so often we see, and again, it kind of relates back to what you were talking about earlier, but has the car changed direction, rotated enough that the driver can go to full throttle or are they like tipping into the throttle. Now they cause the car to understeer a little bit. Now they're running on a road and they do that little lift a little bit right at the end of the, at, right. as they approach the exit curb. And, oh, now they get to full throttle. Whereas right. the other driver hesitated off the pedals just a little longer back in the corner, let the car change direction. And where they first tip into the throttle is maybe a little bit later, but they go all the right. way to full throttle. Right. Well, that's that's throttle commit point, right? Yeah, would be would be how I talk about that. Like, and you know, when I look at data, one of the things when I'm looking at data, and I'm, uh, you know, you probably have a similar metric in your in your brain, but when I look at data and I'm looking at a throttle trace, if I see a throttle where I see a guy starting to do what I say chase the throttle, right, starting to chase the throttle, and then I see him give throttle up and chase the throttle, and then worst case scenario, give it up again, and then finally finish going to throttle. 
I go, okay, there's a, you know, you don't even have to like look at anything else. You're like, okay, you tried to go to throttle too soon, right? I mean, that's just easy. And I sit there and I, you know, what I tell people what I'm looking for is I don't mind if you start to chase throttle and then there's a little plateau, like, oh, I got to wait a second. I got to just wait a second and then I can finish chasing some throttle. Like to me, that's okay, right? It doesn't have to be this beautiful linear line of throttle build in this theoretical world. You know, you don't need some some beautiful, you know, geometric curve of, of the throttle. But what you also don't want is you don't want those, oh, my God, I had to lift. Right? Yes. Um, so once you start, with, and that's telling you that your throttle commit point was too soon, right? You're trying to go to throttle and you couldn't commit to throttle. Um, you know, and those are, but those are, but then that sort of ties back around to the one pedal or the other, right? And how many guys, like, I'm going to ask you this question. How many times do you have people totally look at you sideways? when when they're doing a good job and you're like okay what we got to do is let's work on building more rolling speed in the corner by the way you're going to go to throttle later and you're going to get the same exit speed and they totally look at you sideways yeah. how, how often yeah uh 51.7 percent of the time <laughs> <laughs> uh it, it, and i would say uh, that actually uh, my yeah. coaching style my coaching style is uh, depending on the driver and where they are, but a lot of times I'm going to say that I work with drivers on rolling speed earlier than they have probably been taught before. So from the very beginning, I'm already working on that. Right. And, yeah, exactly. And, and I just use the example of, you know, do you want to start accelerating from 51 miles an hour or from 53 miles an hour? Which right. would you rather do? Right. No, exactly. But see, then that also gets balanced. It's so interesting. The uh, and thank you, thank God, you said fifty one point seven because <laughs> all the time, in order to make people remember things, I'll say percentages in in like you know break it down into tenths, right? Yeah. And I'll go, well, there's an eighty eight point three percent, you know, whatever, because it makes them look at you, right? Like it snaps them out of their sort of lackadaisical, I'm paying attention mode. Right? Well, and, and I use that all the time where I say, you know, that eighty eight point seven percent of there was a study done that eighty eight point seven three one percent of all statistics <laughs> right. were made up, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, they so the, but then the flip side of that is so then you get the guy who, you know, think you go back to the learning curve where the guy learned that, you know, oh, my God, the brake pedal is a great place to, to make time. And by the way, this ABS really freaking works. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so they're so they, it's like, you know, there's it's wonderful and they're holding on to it like, you know, uh, you know, uh, like a newborn baby. And uh, and so then. Then you get the guy that is like, I just can't break late enough, right? So now instead of rolling that 53 miles an hour, they're rolling 57 and are forced to go to throttle late because they there's no way that the car can accept that much rolling speed, right? Right. So there's that, yeah, it's, it's, it's that, and, and I'm sure, you know, it's the, we all go through the same thing with people. It's, it's, you know, you've got the people that number one are slowing up too much and trying to go to throttle too soon. Right. And then the flip side is, is then you've got you've got the the temptation of then they can tip over the other way, which is, oh, my God, this brake pedal is the most wonderful thing. Rolling speeds, the most wonderful thing. And they tip over into now you're not really good off the corner. And by the way, your lap time's the same, but you're now have traded off some exit speed and some elapsed time on the straightaway for a better brake zone and better rolling speed in, right? Like, it's like, where is that, you know, let's find a balance here, yeah. right? And by the way, then it's like, let's find a balance in the right corners because certain corners, that entry speed is going to be, oh my God, what you want, right? And I don't really care that you're three miles an hour slower at the exit. And then there's other times that, oh my God, I need that car to be really getting every bit of exit speed it can. And I think that's a that's another huge myth that gets driven into people early on in their driving career that it, it's all about that you know in slow out fast thing, right? You know, and, and again, good safe place to start, uh, but there comes a point in time where that's just uh, it, you're wasting time in a lot of corners. Not I shouldn't say a lot of corners in some corners. 
because I don't right. want somebody to go, oh, well, I just heard that I should go fast into every single corner. Uh, right. But there are places where it's more about entry speed than it is about exit speed or more Absolutely. about rolling speed than it is about exit speed. Right. And I think, but it's interesting. I still find, and, and you know, maybe it's my early Skippy background, right, where you know, it was like, you know, it, you know, when I and I taught for Skip there for a long time. So it's certainly built into my brain. But it's like, you know, it's 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 having that procedure, which is you establish an exit speed. Right. Yeah. Um, and you would establish an exit speed with good, solid entry speed happening, but just not trying to find the last bit in entry speed. Once you've established, OK, this is the fastest my car can leave this corner. Then you start moving that break point in. And by the way, hopefully with the guidance with from people like you or I or from reading stuff, you know, then it's like, okay, you start to figure out when you should be getting off the brake pedal. But the thing is you're trying to maintain that exit speed, right? Like yeah. that's your kind of t typical 90 degree corner, you know, long straightaway leading into it, long straightaway leading out of it, you know, approach is, is trying to find that. And, and just to, once again, since we're coming up with, you know, we're coming up with, you know, we're at rule number 5,718 right now. Point five. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> point five. Um, which is, by the way, if you go back to, you know, I'm teaching a guy the first time driving around a racetrack and he's showing up in his car that's probably too fast for him to be learning in, um, that whole in slow out fast thing sounds terrifying to me because then you've got the guy that he's starting to you know he's driving around you've, you've taught him to you know you're saying to him turn late um you know in slow out fast you know accelerate off the corner everybody knows how to accelerate right um that's a pretty easy skill and now you got this guy in a you know in his car and he's starting to get a little comfortable and he's like oh now i need to try to keep up with people First mistake people make is they start instead of turning later, they're starting to turn earlier. Right. And it's not necessarily a mistake, but it's the first propensity. Right. They start heading towards that. And now he's turning earlier and he's starting to chase the throttle. And at some point he tips over there. Right. Um, where he's now turning early, not going super fast, but man, he can crack into that throttle early. And, you know, to me, then it's a disaster waiting at the exit. Um, so I think that, you know, I, it, it comes back around to, you know, and it, it, I think it comes back around to something that I really try to do with all my drivers, which is you try to teach them what they're going to want to be doing when they're going fast right from the beginning. Um, yes. You know, the pattern, the pattern, right? Like when I was doing that team camp uh. at Monticello with those kids that hadn't driven so much, never driven around a racetrack before, you know, I was talking about you know, with the instructors, the, the instructor core there at Monticello that I was working with, it's like, let's get a pattern established. You know, when you're, if you're driving these kids around in the van or you're talking to them, you got to be sort of talking to them a pattern. If you're doing a lead follow, I want them to see the pattern of what you're doing in that car in front of them. I want, you know, even though you're going so slow, you don't need to break and turn. I want to see you if it's corner that they're going to end up having to break and turn in. I want to see brake lights going into that corner because they need to see brake lights going into that corner. Right. You know, it's the same thing with using all the road, you know, how, you know, small pet peeve, how many guys do you, have you worked with that are like, yeah, I'll use all the road when I'm going fast enough. Uh, and you're like, oh uh, boy, <laughs> don't even get me started, you know, because your brain isn't going to let you. Well, I'm glad you brought this up because to me, that's all it, it's programming, right? We're building the programming yeah. to do the right things. And one of the, uh, you know, one of my huge pet peeves, pet peeves is when somebody says, Oh, well, you know, we don't teach trail braking because that's an advanced technique. You know, we teach <laughs> drivers that they should get off the brake pedal and yeah. before they turn into the corner. Well, what has that done? It's just built this habit, this program, this pattern right. to do it the wrong way. And, you know, I use the example all the time as, you know, if we told, if we, we told kids that before you go to school, like up until they, the moment they go to school, that call your lunch a, a frog, you know, and right. use that. And we teach them that your lunch is a frog. And then they go to school and they go, I'm going to eat my frog now. Right. <laughs> you know, like that's just stupid to teach somebody the wrong thing only right. to then have to fix it later on. That is just, I mean, it's it's an evil thing to do to somebody. No, absolutely. And that is, 
you know, and that's why I think that that, you know, that programming, as you call it, patterning as I do. Yep. Um, you know, it's it's I think that's hyper important right from the beginning, which is, you know, and I find myself and I'm sure you do the same, you know. So, OK, here's another pet peeve. Total steps, total step <laughs> sideways. So how many times have you gotten in the car with a good race car driver, maybe even a better than good race car driver? Um, to do a rental car lap of the racetrack, right? Uh-huh. And they're driving around and they're not online. Yeah. Oh. Right? Kill uh, me. And I and I'll take that and I'll take that right back to walking around the racetrack. I, like, agree. I go I go on a track walk and I am walking where the cockpit is, where that driver will be sitting. And there's people like 20 feet away <laughs> wandering along. And I'm like, are you wh- what are you doing? And they're like, well, we can hear you. And, and you're just like, oh, my God, like, she, like, put an ice pick in my eye, right? Because you, you're just not it, it goes back to the basic pattern. Yes. Right. Yes. You're not starting to see you're not starting to see the sight pictures you should be seeing. You're not on the pavement you're going to be on. You're so, not standing right next to the curb. You're not standing on top of the curb. You're going to drive over, um, you know, and or if you're driving around, it's like. You know, and I find myself after having done this, you know, for for 40 years, um, you know, I find myself driving around and my feet and my hands are doing exactly what they would be doing if I was driving around at speed. And that's just at this point, that's just so ingrained in me. It's it's a little scary, actually. It's a little Stepford Stepford wipes. Uh, So so I got to ask, how many times have you been doing a track walk and you find yourself bumping into people? You've got a track that's like super wide. Oh my god! Yeah, and you're walking the line, but they're just walking down the middle of the track. But in the process, you're crossing, right. and you end up bumping into people, and they're like, "What's wrong?" And, and you're like, "I'm walking the line," and, right. and they don't understand. Right. Yeah, so that's another one. Yeah. That yeah, uh, you ask the question, how often do I see people not driving the line? Uh, way, 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 way too often. Oh. The other one is, is even like on a warm up lap, a cool down lap. They drive offline or they right. do something completely different. They don't hold the steering wheel properly. They don't, you know, right. to me, even on those laps, you want to be in the same gear most of the time, unless right. there's a reason not to be. But yeah, just it's it's that programming pattern. So, uh, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, and by, and by I, you way, and I could do a track walk together. Uh, yeah, exactly. We'd, we'd be yeah, drafting. So, I know. We, well, besides the fact, we both want to be standing in the same spot. Yeah. But the. Uh, hey, Mike. But, yeah. You'd be behind me. Yeah. Oh, right. sorry. I couldn't dream, resist dream, that. Dream, dream on, dream on old man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, so, but the, so, <laughs> oh God, don't even get me started. Yeah. The, uh, you know, I may be a soft spoken guy, but I'm really competitive. The, uh, but the, uh, you know, that's what happens when having seven older brothers and sisters, right? The, uh, but, um, so, Here's something I think that should be said at this point for both of us, right? Which is we've both been ranting and we've both been talking about, oh, my God, this is stuff that drives me crazy. Why do people do this? Why do people do that? The reality is, is that anybody listening to this and feel free to have a different opinion on this, but anybody listening to this should be listening to these rants and say, okay, you know what? Here, here's Ross and Mike ranting about this stuff. But the reality is, is they're ranting about stuff that should be done a different way, or they're ranting about why can't we do it this way, which goes back to us just wanting to be teachers. And, you know, I don't think people should look at this as, oh my God, this is just a chance for for Ross and Mike to rant about stuff. But the reality is, is for me, I look at it and, and I'm sure you do too. I mean, I'm, if I'm at a racetrack and I see somebody, you know, maybe I've met them in in the lunch line or they've come by to talk to my driver and I'm like, Oh, they're a pretty nice guy. And I watch them driving around later and I'm like, Oh my God, why are they doing that? Right. Or you just see somebody you don't know. And it's like, you just want to walk up to him and basically be like, can you just stop doing this? (laughs) Right. Um, Cause you'll make me feel better, (laughs) you know? Um, But, and that's kind of what I feel about like these rants is, you know, you and I both have a list going here and, uh, you know, quite a long list. And it's just like, it's less like, can we just get people to stop doing this stuff? Right. Because it'll make you a better driver. And that's why I think people listening to this podcast should be 
having that mindset. So, Mike, are you okay with th- – this is so cool, but we've gone a little bit longer than I usually go on these podcasts. Are you okay making this a two-parter? Absolutely. We so, can make it a 20-parter. Yeah, I mean, because we could go on for a while here. And I think the point is, is that you just made here is ultimately it's because we care. You know, yeah, we're ranting. Yes, we're saying don't do that or do this and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, ultimately it is because we care. And because I care about – uh this podcast being useful. I'm going to say, let's stop this one now and we're going to pick it up immediately here, but it's going to be next week's podcast. Uh, so everybody, listeners, uh, tune in next week for part two of Mike and Ross's crazy rants about uh, myths in, in driving. So more, uh, more, more old guys being cranky. They're cranky old guys. <laughs> there you go. So uh, for all of you, uh, take what you've heard today, use it for good, not evil, and then be back next week for Mike and I for some more. Do you have a burning question about racing or high-performance driving? Then head to speedsecrets.com and check out the Ask Ross column. Every week, Ross answers a question, the one you may be wondering about right now. And if your question has not been answered already, zap Ross an email at info at speedsecrets.com. He will add it to the list, and your question will be published on the Speed Secrets website. Ask away at info at speedsecrets.com. Mm-hmm.